welcome to LifeSpring Church. We hope you enjoy this message. To find out more about LifeSpring Church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifeSpring UK. I'm excited. Um, I cannot tell you how excited and glad I am to be standing here. Um, and it is my privilege and honor to bring the word today. So, uh, if you have been following our services over the last couple of months, or if you are new to our church, we've been covering some Old Testament characters. Um, I'm not really a fan of the word characters because it makes them sound fictional or like something out of Marvel Universe or DC Comics, but rest assured that these are true and accurate accounts of very real, very fleshly, and very human people. Uh, so far, what we've done is we looked at Abraham, and then we leapfrogged, as Debs put it, we leapfrogged over Isaac to bring you the story of Jacob. And now I have the pleasure this morning of bringing you an introduction and a peek into the story and the life of Joseph. Pastor Sam very kindly unlocked the door for us last week, uh, but today we're going to kick it open. Amen? Amen? Okay, so with that being said, the title of this talk is A Covenant Keeping God. A covenant means um, an agreement, a contract, or a pact, and as a verb, it's a promise or a pledge. The story of Joseph can be found in Genesis chapters 37 through to 50, uh, but don't worry, we're not going to read all of that today. It's quite chunky, um, but I would always encourage you to go home and read it for yourself, understand the scripture for yourself, and allow the Holy Spirit to make it plain to you also. So how does Joseph come about? Who is Joseph? There is so much depth and richness to unpack in this narrative, but I will be trying my best to give you a firm footing, at least with the basics and the earlier part of his life. If we jump back a few chapters to Genesis 28, what happens is Isaac sends Jacob away. He commands a blessing over him, and he tells him to go and get himself a wife. Effectively, go and carve out a new life for yourself in a place called Padan Aram. When he gets there, he's supposed to seek out the people of Bethuel, who are his mother's relatives. So he sets out, he reaches the land, and sure enough, he encounters his mother's relatives, specifically his uncle Laban. Laban has two daughters. We find out that their names are Leah and Rachel. Leah is older than Rachel, but it is Rachel that Jacob has his eyes on. It's Rachel that Jacob encounters first. If this was 21st century dating, um, it's Rachel that he would have had that connection with. It's Rachel that he would have swiped right for. And so a conversation takes place between uh, Uncle Laban and Jacob, and they come to an agreement that Jacob is going to work for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. So it's like a dowry, a payment to Uncle Laban. There's some underhand tactics and a bit of swindling going on on the side of Uncle Laban, and Jacob ends up married to Leah. He has another conversation with Uncle Laban. He's like, this is not what we agreed. I wanted to marry Rachel. So instead of the seven years, he ends up working 14 years, but ends up with the two wives, both Leah and Rachel. Rachel, unfortunately, is barren, but Leah is having son after son after son after son. Jacob also, in that time, acquires another two wives, so the servant of Rachel and the servant of Leah, their names are Bilhah and Zilpah. And so after a long time of barrenness, Rachel finally has a baby, a boy, and she names him Joseph. From the passage in that particular part of the text, those of you that are familiar with the story, you'll know that Rachel is the woman that Jacob truly loved. The Bible tells us that those initial seven years that he worked for Laban just felt like days. And Rachel is also referred to as both beautiful and lovely. 
So as a result of Jacob's relationship with Rachel, Joseph comes forth. The name itself, Joseph, or by the Hebraic pronunciation, Yosef, means God will give. The verb yasaf means to increase, which root comes from the word yasaf. Yasef and yasaf. So this is Joseph. This is the Joseph. He is the first son of Rachel, but he's the 11th son of Jacob. Joseph is the son of the same Jacob who wrestles with God and became known as Israel. This is Joseph whose great-grandfather is Abraham and his grandfather is Isaac. He has 10 half-brothers, one full brother. He also has a half-sister, so this is a big family. And this is the same Joseph who is catapulted from obscurity to the right hand of Pharaoh the same Joseph who, like his father, dreams. So Joseph is the least, if not one of the least, in his house. And doesn't this remind you of how David started out? What about Gideon? God still locates them and he uses them mightily. And so Pastor Sam last week, he told us that he's the oldest of 14. I can kind of relate to that. My mom is the oldest of 11. And when you are the least in your house, and I can speak on this because I'm one of the youngest of six siblings, there is a pecking order, there's a hierarchy, there is governance. We don't have to jostle for position because you know your place, you just know your place. And I imagine if Joseph had a family tree, his oldest brother, Reuben, would be up here, and Joseph would be somewhere down here. And I work in HR, so I was thinking of it from an organizational chart perspective. I was like, okay, so Reuben would be up here, and Joseph would be way down here. And those of you that are the oldest in your line of siblings will sometimes operate as what I like to call the deputy head parent. <laughs> your younger siblings are almost like your own children and you take charge of them. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to get into the story. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to read from verse 2 to 11. Um, however, James will kindly put the words up on the screen for me as if by magic. There it is. Thank you, James. Um, I'm going to start from the middle of verse 2. So Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him and when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves bowed down to the ground to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he said, sorry, and then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come down and bow to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The Amplified Bible tells us that Jacob wondered what the dream meant. 
And so there's four significant points that I want to pull out from this text. Point number one is that Joseph is favored by his father. He is the son of his father's old age. And look at Isaac, Jacob's father. He too was the son of his father's old age. So there's a sense of fulfillment. God has done it for Abraham. He's done it for me too. So this is a special child. I like to believe that Joseph is the pinnacle as well of, of Jacob's relationship with Rachel. He is adored by his father and it's no secret. The second point I want to point out is that Joseph is contending with a sea of jealousy and envy. Envy being said to be a discontented longing for someone else's advantages. And jealousy is said to be an unpleasant suspicion or apprehension of rivalship. So his brothers are bitter. They even think of killing Joseph, but oh no, wait, let's throw him into the pit. But then Judah has a brainchild. He says, no, 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 we don't want any blood on our hands, but let's benefit from this. Let's sell him into slavery. But his brothers had no aforethought or knowledge that in all their wicked thinking, God had a plan. It's worth pointing out that Joseph's older brother, Reuben, actually tried to save Joseph, but by the time he came back to the pit where he'd been thrown in, Joseph was gone. Point number three is that Joseph is a man of integrity. He tells his dad about his brother's bad behavior. He gives his father a report of their antics. And so there's a level of responsibility that is ascribed to Joseph. And later on, we see the behavior of Potiphar's wife. Joseph still remained a man of honor and sought to do and say the right thing. And point number four is that Joseph has two gifts. He has the physical gift, so the tunic, the robe, the garment, or the coat, depending on which translation of the Bible you cleave to. And he also has a spiritual gift, the one of dreams. And so these two dreams that we've just read about in Genesis 37 are probably not Joseph's only encounter with dreams. And also, if we read on in the story, we get to see that Joseph has more encounter with other people's dreams. I also like to think that Joseph's spiritual gift of dreams is threefold. I say that because, one, he can dream, and not only does he dream, he dreams prophetically. Two, he remembers and he can relay it back line upon line, scene upon scene, this is what I dreamt. And how many of us wake up and we forget what we've just had a dream about? And the third part of his gift is that he can interpret, he can hear the dream once and he'll say to you, this is what your dreams mean. So rest assured, saints, dreams matter. As I was doing my research for this talk, I encountered dreams between the Old and the New Testament 21 times. There are 21 significant dreams that are mentioned, and their purpose was to serve as a warning, to bring prophecy or confirmation, or to give direction. Look at these other dreams. Joseph, who was betrothed to Mary, has a dream where an angel appears to him and gives him very specific instructions of what to do and where to go. And what about Daniel, who had the gift by God's grace to interpret dreams? Look at his interaction with King Nebuchadnezzar. And the interpretation of dreams belongs to God. Look at Genesis 40 verse 8. Joseph states this clearly as he's interpreting dreams for the cupbearer and the baker who, is, who are in prison with him at that point. In Acts 16, Paul has a dream where a man is urging him to go over to Macedonia. And what about Jacob? We read a couple of weeks ago that Jacob dreamed. We went through the story of Jacob's ladder. And so from this, we can establish that dreams matter. Dreams are prophetic. Dreams bring revelation, and dream interpretation is wisdom. 
Dreams are another language of the Holy Spirit. The disciple Luke quotes, in, uh, quotes Joel 2.28 as he writes it in Acts 2.17, and it says this, and in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Job 33.15 says, in a dream, a vision of the night, one may hear God's voice when deep sleep falls on men while slumbering upon the bed. Numbers 12 and 6 says, and he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. And Daniel 1.17, it says this, and for, sorry, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had all understanding in visions and dreams. So dreams matter. God spoke and he speaks to us in dreams. Between Joseph being sold into slavery and serving as Pharaoh's right-hand man, there is a period of 13 years so between the dream that he tells his brothers they sell him into slavery, he serves in Potiphar's house, he ends up in prison, and then he's at Pharaoh's right-hand man. There are 13 years. And I wondered if he battled with these dreams. I wonder if he doubted their revelation or maybe even forgot about them. And what if I told you that there was a purpose for his weight, a reason for his suffering or a point to him experiencing the worst kind of betrayal from his own flesh and blood. Everything that Joseph went through, both good and bad, was so that God would keep his promise. This generation had to be preserved. The lineage needed to continue, and this family will multiply. Genesis 22, verse 17. And I'm going to drop a little spoiler alert. Um, but this is part one of Joseph. Stay tuned for part two next week. So for Joseph to get from Genesis chapter 37 through to chapter 50, a necessary pain must take place. For him to be sold into slavery, he needed to have brothers who hated him and were jealous of him and were motivated by the hatred of him. Angeline, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let me put it to you this way. Joseph, spoiler alert, at the end of the story, he needs to be in Egypt. He needs to be in the palace of Pharaoh as his right-hand man. And if he had been left to his own devices, would he have gone willingly? Would he have left his family? Would he have been able to create the encounters and the connections that catapulted him to his final destination? No, it needed God. Only God could have arranged Joseph's life so strategically. I watched, as I was preparing for this talk, I watched Joseph, King of Dreams. It's very good, you should watch it. Um, and in it, we get to see the scene whereby Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. He witnesses this as his captors are binding him, and they trade the silver pieces for Joseph's life. And in the scene, it's quite heartbreaking. He begs for his brothers to save him, and they turn their backs and walk away from him. And I wonder if any of us here, if we had been Joseph and that was our experience and we're being sold by our own flesh and blood, is this one of these trials that we would say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. Because this is definitely one of those trials where it looks like we are abandoned by everyone, but God is using every opportunity, both good and bad, to move us exactly to where we are supposed to be. Psalms 37, I love this, verse 23 and 24, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. 
And it reminded me of the song that we sing all the time. So as I was preparing for this talk, I was like, okay, definitely need the band to sing Alpha and Omega. I was texting Studio, and Studio's like, I'm not available, Matthew's on holiday. I was like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? I text Uncle John, and Uncle John's like, it's already on the set list, Angeline, don't worry. And how good was Esther? <laughs> praise God, praise God. And so we sing the song Alpha and Omega. We are giving praise and acknowledgement that the living God is the beginning and the end. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. So God is our Alpha and our Omega. When we sing that song, do we truly believe it? When we sing the words of that song, do we truly know it in our hearts? He knows the story. He knows all of our stories, beginning to end and end to beginning. God saw the famine that would wipe out this generation coming, so he orchestrates it that one of their own would be in a place of power, a place of influence and respect in order to allow the children of Jacob called Israel to be saved. Joseph's brothers had to leave their land and travel to Egypt to buy grain, grain that Joseph has in ample supply, grain that Joseph has wisely saved, and grain that Joseph could distribute as he pleased. And so God kept and continued to keep his covenant. And how did God do this? He places Joseph in the palace this is our covenant keeping God by any means necessary. He places Joseph in the palace. I mentioned before how Joseph was favored by his father, but look at, as you continue to read the story, he's favored by Potiphar, he's favored by the prison warden, and then he's favored by Pharaoh, but it was never about Joseph. It was all about God and the power of God working and moving in him and through him. And that favor that Joseph experienced was evidence that the hand of God was upon him. And I'm about to close. So I want you to think about the faithfulness of God. What has God been speaking to you about or reminding you about? Perhaps there is a dream that he has given you, a vision that he has laid on your heart. God will place you in the palace, in his way, in his time. But please don't get it twisted. I'm not saying God will place you in a literal palace. That would be amazing if he did. But I believe that your palace is your right place. That is where you are supposed to be. The place you are supposed to end up is your palace. And some of us, if not all of us, and I'll include myself in this, so please don't feel like I'm up here pointing fingers. If we could see the trajectory of our lives over the next five or 10 years, both good and bad, would we move willingly or would we be stuck in the same place, comfortable, complacent? And throughout all his pain and troubles, before he reached the palace, Joseph, he remains faithful. He remained a man of integrity and he trusted God, but he kept going. Galatians 6 and 9 says, and let us not grow weary while we're doing good for in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So I wanna ask you a question, church. Do you trust God? We say it in songs, we might say it in prayer, but do we really trust God? Um, and as I was preparing for the service and praying about it, I really felt laid upon my heart that there is someone who has a lost dream, someone who has a forgotten dream, or maybe someone here, your dream has completely died. And I really believe that God would like to resurrect those dreams, remind you of his promises. And if that is you, I really encourage you to come to receive some prayer. God has, has not forgotten you. I'll just read this last scripture. And it comes out of Numbers 23, verse 19. It says this, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said 
and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good and fulfill it? I had some life group applications, but I realized that we have uh, make room next week. Um, but if I can have, thank you, James, the life group applications for maybe the week after, or if you have a quiet moment in your cell, um, it would be worth just going through these points. And I just want to pray, um, and then I'll hand over to the, to the worship team. Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you are doing in our lives. God, I thank you that you are the Alpha and Omega. God, I thank you that you are the one who lays dreams and visions upon our hearts and you do it for a purpose. And God, I just really want to pray encouragement for anyone here right now, oh God, who is feeling helpless or hopeless. Anyone here who is feeling that, like their dreams are forgotten or that God doesn't know where they are or God doesn't see them. Lord, would you remind them of your power? Would you remind them of your promises? Would you remind them of your faithfulness? And God, I pray a hedge of protection around each and every single person in here. Oh God, would you protect that word? Would you seal it with the blood of Jesus? I pray that the enemy has no recourse to it, no right to it. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray a blessing and a covering over your children in the name of Yeshua. Father God, I pray and I ask that you do what only you can do. And God, I bless you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. To find out more about our church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifespringUK.